the New York Times once again. I'm not trying to publish, you know, I'm not in the pay of the New York Times, but they keep having things about, this is from yesterday's New York Times. Very interesting article about in, in Rio, in Brazil, Rio de Janeiro, where they are digging up the whole city to build stadiums and colossal waste of money for the World Cup, which is taking place, the soccer World Cup this summer, and then in 2016, the Summer Olympics. While they are digging things up, they keep running into archaeological sites related to the history of slavery. Uh, in Brazil, and the question is, what do you do? Do you just bulldoze them over, or do you try to preserve them, investigate them? They're the wharf where slaves were landed, the uh, uh, places they were kept, auction houses where slaves were sold, and um, it, the article is quite interesting. It points out that we may have mentioned this: Brazil was really the major, the biggest center of the slave trade in the Western Hemisphere. Nearly five million slaves were brought to Brazil, mostly from southern Africa, not West Africa, like to the Caribbean and the US, but from Angola, places like that. Um, nearly five million slaves. Rio had more slaves than any city in the Western Hemisphere in the 18th, early 19th century. And uh, one of the things that's relevant for what we're going to talk about today, it talks about how concepts of race have changed in Brazil for a long time there was this idea there was no race in Brazil. The, you know, that they, the racial rainbow, there were mixing of races, everybody was a Brazilian. More recently, they even have now an official day called Black Consciousness Day, where, which emphasizes the role of people of African descent in Brazilian history and singles them out, rather than denying that race has played a f role, a very important role in Brazilian history. The point of that is, is just to say, Race systems, race consciousness, racism is part, are all part of history. They have a history. They are not constant. They are not deus ex machinas, which you bring in to explain everything, as too often historians do. And the same thing happens in the United States. Racism has existed in the United States, but it's not always the same. It's not always as strong as at other times. And what we're going to talk about today, the black soldier in the Civil War, the service of black soldiers played a critical role in, I think, weakening racism, at least for a time, in the Civil War North and into the Reconstruction era. Um, this is a famous recruiting uh, poster for black soldiers, come and join us brothers. But it took a good while to get to the point where the army was actually welcoming African American men into the army. Now, stepping back for a minute, until recently, as the phrase went, in American wars, blacks had to fight for the right to fight. In other words, in the Revolution, in the Civil War, in World War I and World War II, blacks were either at the beginning just excluded from the army altogether or not particularly welcome in the army. And in all of those wars, as well as smaller ones, the African-American leaders insisted on the right of African-American men to be in the army, just like everybody else, to participate. To f they fought for the right to fight and won it, and by fighting, African-Americans generally, not always, that fighting in the army sort of pushes forward claims for equal rights, for citizenship rights, uh, and leads to some amelioration of race relations in the US. Not always, and sometimes temporary. World War I did not have that effect. It produced massive racial violence in the United States. East St. Louis, Chicago, lynching of black soldiers when they returned to the South from the war. But certainly the revolution, the service of blacks helped to stimulate the abolition of slavery in the North. Service of black soldiers in the Civil War had a lot to do with making emancipation uh, final and um, opening up the possibility of rights after the war. World War II, I think, was the beginning of the modern civil rights movement and black service in the army there had a lot to do with that. Now, the pattern has changed in more recent wars. In Vietnam, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, there were complaints that minorities, racial minorities, African Americans and others, actually uh, 
There were too many of them in the army. There were too many of them in combat. In Vietnam, like a third of the soldiers on the, in, not exactly a front line, but in combat platoons were African American, far more than their percentage. In other words, the draft was working in a disadvantageous or unfair way, groveling up black men and leaving many whites out. Uh, and similar complaints have uh, surfaced about the, today, where a large percentage of the soldiers in Iraq and Afghanistan are African American. Now, what's interesting about black service in the Civil War is, among many other things, is how it was erased from history for a long time. Um, one well-known history book in the 1920s uh, said, quote, the American Negroes are the only people in history who became free without any effort on their own behalf. No effort, in other words, they played no role. Whites gave freedom to African Americans. And black soldiers, uh, Kirk Savage and others have written about this, are pretty much invisible in most Civil War monuments in the North. Every town in the North has a Civil War monument somewhere. Very, very few of them have an image of a black soldier. There, are, there is an exception now in Washington, D.C., where there is a monument to the service of African American soldiers, which was opened up some few years ago in Washington. And we'll talk about this, the great St. Gordon's monument to the 54th Massachusetts on Boston Common, if you've ever been in Boston or seen that fantastic work of sculpture of St. Gordon's. But those are exceptions. Some, uh, one of did a study found only a, less than a dozen images of black soldiers in Civil War monuments all around the North. So this kind of erasure from history, uh, which lasted a long time. Now, more recently, historians have tended to emphasize the role of black troops. The public is much more aware of it, partly thanks to the movie Glory, which came out 20 odd years ago and is, what can I say? It's about as accurate as most uh, Hollywood movies. Um, but it certainly did draw attention to uh, the service of this one unit, the 54th Massachusetts. But during the war, people were well aware of this. Lincoln himself many times said that without black soldiers, this is in the second half of the war, uh, the war could not be won. By the end of the war, there was something 180,000 black men had served in the Union Army and about 20 to 30,000 in the Union Navy. Um, that's about 10 percent of the total number of men, which is about two million, who served for the Union in the Civil War. So it's a significant chunk of that, of that uh, uh, manpower. And service in the Army, many historians have emphasized lately, puts the question of black citizenship on the national agenda as the Civil War ends. And that's something that people like Frederick Douglass and many others who urged African Americans to serve in the army, insisted that this would lead, the reason to serve is not only to fight the war, but to gain rights for the post-war world. Now, of course, one might want to say, is citizenship something you have to prove yourself for? White people are just citizens by being born here, right? There is no, I've never heard of a white person who was denied citizenship because they didn't serve in the army, right? And what does this mean for women and their relationship to citizenship? If citizenship is a reward for military service, well, of course, today there are women in the army, but there certainly weren't back in the Civil War era. In other words, the very emphasis on the citizenship thing, I think, raises uncomfortable questions about what citizenship is and who ought to be entitled to it. But nonetheless, that was a major discourse in the Civil War years. 